So I'd like to talk a little bit about bipolar disorder. Uh, it's a psychiatric disorder, a mental disorder. Uh, it's characterized by episodes of either depression, uh, which is obviously low mood and uh, exhaustion, and mania, which is characterized by high mood and uh, increased energy. And these states uh, alternate with each other over often a lifetime. And they can be extremely difficult to manage and very difficult and destructive of patients' lives. So what we see when we first see someone with depression or with mania is a very clear change from their normal state. And this usually happens, or starts for the first time, uh, between the ages of 15 and 25. Now it's not invariable that that happens, but that's the commonest way in which it starts. And when it starts with depression, it is difficult to diagnose because depression could simply be common or garden depression not bipolar disorder, you've got to have a manic episode before you can say that someone has a bipolar disorder. And that sometimes takes a little while to materialize and to be manifest. So when you have seen a manic episode in a, in a person, then you know that they have a pretty long uh, haul ahead of them and you've got to think carefully about how you should propose treatment. How do we recognize mania? Well, mania presents with increased energy, reduced need for sleep, tremendous enthusiasm, overconfidence, and this can even get to the level of becoming psychotic. And people become quite deluded about their powers, their ability, uh, the prospects that are ahead of them. And sometimes under those circumstances, they make really bad decisions. And those decisions can be about money, uh, they can be about uh, their relationships, uh, they can be about uh, taking big risks generally, be they physical, psychological, or literally a monetary. And so those risks often translate into minor disasters or quite major disasters for people. So when people develop mania, it's important to try and cut it short. And that's often a reason why people come to a psychiatric hospital for the first time. And we continue to have to use psychiatric inpatient facilities to look after people with mania. What is a longer term problem for these people, however, is usually the depression. And the depression kind of follows the mania often rather like the night follows the day. And the depression is something that the patients really don't like. It's extremely unpleasant. People feel lacking in energy, leaden. Uh, they lack in interest. Uh, they lack in uh, any kind of optimism for the future. And uh, they may very well get suicidal and feel suicidal. And indeed, I'm afraid that suicide is not uncommon in patients with bipolar disorder. And it's usually in the first phase of their life with the disorder that it, it occurs. So this is often happening to young people. And that's, in its way, is often a tragedy. So that is, that is the kind of the outline of the disorder. What causes it? Well, we think now that we, we're pretty confident that most of the causation lies in genetics. But those genetic causes are filtered obviously through one's environment, one's growing up in a particular setting, uh, one's experiences. And although we don't think that those are fundamentally important, if they're very adverse, then they often make the course of the illness worse. So if you have a bipolar genetic risk and you also, on top of that, have very difficult early experiences, then very often the bipolar disorder is worse. So that's a kind of the cocktail that we unfortunately often see in our patients and that makes them more severely ill. But the genetic causes are now increasingly understood to be not just a single gene or several genes, but many genes. And these genes all exercise a minor effect. So the, the analogy that we usually use is between getting a deck, of a deck of cards, you get a hand of cards, each card is maybe slightly different. We have variation in our genes in our set of cards. And you play that set of cards as your, as it were, as your life's chances. And if your life chances are loaded up for bipolar disorder, then that's often the way it goes. And if you are an identical twin of someone with bipolar disorder, the chances you get it are extremely high. So we're talking about 80%. If you're a, 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 a non-identical twin or a brother or sister, then those risks are very much lower. And if you're the child of someone with bipolar disorder, 
you often find, you, we were often asked this, the chances that you get the illness is only about 6%. So it's a genetic disorder, it's not due to single genes, we can't imagine treating it through eradicating the genes, but we do have to think about how we treat it because for many people it's such a very difficult problem. Now the main way in which we treat it is that we have to look at the different phases of the illness. So if you look at mania, because it's such an emergency, because people are often so disturbed, because their behaviour is so abnormal, we usually have to use medications, and those medications can be difficult for the patients to accept. Uh, they're usually based on the blockade of dopamine function in the brain. And the drugs are sometimes called antipsychotic drugs. Uh, so the classic antipsychotic drug that was invented now a long time ago was chlorpromazine, and that, when it was very first, first invented in the 1950s, it was actually used on manic patients. And we continue to use the, um, the, the newer versions of chlorpromazine to treat the acute phase of the disorder. And it's important that we do that so that it's not too prolonged, that people don't stay in hospital too, too, for too long a stay, and that we don't get the consequences of profound and prolonged overactivity, which in the past used to be in themselves quite dangerous. So getting people out of their manic episodes is relatively straightforward, and at least there's a formula for doing it. Depressive episodes are rather more difficult. Depressive episodes may spontaneously get better, um, but treating them is often quite tricky, and we often have to have patients. There are a number of medications available for that, and we also use various forms of psychological treatment that seem to help. But getting people better from depression is more difficult, and depression more often becomes rather chronic so that people remain somewhat depressed after their recovery from mania or their recovery from severe depression, and that's very troublesome for them. And it's all too easy for us to accept that outcome because it's kind of, the, the problem lies with the patient. So you have to work quite hard to make sure that people make a full recovery. Now what keeps people well uh, is a range of things. One is that they have to make important lifestyle choices. So if they have a particularly up and down sort of world in which they're forever running themselves to the max on the one hand and then collapsing on the other, certain sorts of lifestyle lend themselves to that. If they're using stimulant drugs, cocaine, um, or indeed probably cannabis, we think that that's a bad idea for, for those people. Um, and if in addition they are taking upon themselves massive risks and and pressures which are putting them under major strain. So we think that those sorts of things people have to be realistic about. And so it's difficult sometimes for them to make the adjustments because they're used to kind of running their engine at full speed and that's not something probably they can continue to do. Um, in addition, it's very commonly the case that uh, patients will be recommended to take medications that stabilize the mood. In other words, they prevent these episodes of depression or mania and the one that the most famous of them is a, is a drug called lithium. Uh, lithium is an element, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, it was, it's, it's present in and mined as a, an element to put in batteries, but its most important use in man, I would argue, is to treat bipolar disorder. And what we see when we use lithium is that there's a surprising reduction in the frequency of severe episodes and pretty good evidence that we reduce the risk of suicide. This was an effect that was discovered over, over 60 years ago. Um, and it's very surprising that we've not really done a lot better since, uh, since that discovery. The mechanism is probably through chemis brain chemistry that links to how transmitters in the brain communicate uh, for nerve cells. Uh, so we think we sort of understand the mechanism, but we've not yet ever produced something that substitutes as effectively for lithium. There are other medications that are used. Um, they're often um, from, originally, their use in epilepsy. We don't quite understand what the link between epilepsy and bipolar disorder is, whether there's some sort of common pharmacology, some common ground on which the pharmacology works. But nevertheless, they do seem to be useful. And there are drugs like, pardon me, lamotrigine and uh, others that, that are used um, to, to manage patients in the long term with bipolar disorder. Finally, we think that it's very important for patients to understand their illness. So part of the role of the psychiatrist, the doctor, is to communicate to the patient 
the risks around their illness, what shapes it, what precipitates episodes and what they can do to reduce that. And that's what we often call psychoeducation. And that's the foundation really of the relationship that the doctor must have uh, with the patient. And if you get the formula right between psychoeducation on the one hand, which is essentially psychological and behavioral, and medication on the other, and you strive to avoid the adverse effects of the various medications that we use, then you can often come up with a way for people to live pretty se se securely with their illness. Unfortunately, that's not true of everybody. And for those people for whom it's not true, uh, bipolar disorder is a very major burden. And even for those for whom we're successful, they're often less able to earn, for example, earn a living at the level that they would have expected to. And they have to make very major adjustments. So bipolar disorder is one of these conditions which really challenges the individual. It, it affects in its more severe forms about almost one in a hundred people. And in its milder forms, it affects another one in a hundred people. So it's pretty common. And if we all know well about 200 people, the chances are we know at least one person with bipolar disorder. So it's not something that's foreign another. It's part of all our lives and it's something we need to know about.